governance whole. For GGDI, low emissions development is a pathway, it's not an end in itself. Uh, and we found that uh, we've, we've, we've provoked a great deal of resonance with the governments we work with by signing on immediately up front to the broad economic uh, objectives of those governments. Uh, and when I say economic, um, almost always those objectives include, crucially, social and environmental goals as well. But in every case I can think of, uh, growth is key. Growth is a sign of development, a sign of progress, of delivering prosperity to people. So for GGDI, it's no accident that uh, the second G uh, is uh, the third, I'm sorry, the third, the third G is in some ways the, uh, the most important. It's, uh, it, it's all about growth. Uh, and there are two consequences that we found uh, of starting with growth, with the broad economic objectives of most governments. And those two consequences are really important in delivering success to the sorts of, uh, the sorts of question, in the sorts of areas that, that uh, you've mentioned. One is that uh, immediately um, you, you attract a strong commitment, a strong political commitment from the government you're working with. Uh, because you're serving their objectives, you're not uh, attempting to persuade them of a set of new objectives which have been delivered from on high or from some external source. You're working inside the context uh, that they form. So you've got strong political commitment. That creates uh, a very positive dynamic for change because you immediately have a good prospect of attracting champions uh, who matter in the country, the economy that you're working in. Uh, and for us, that in GDGI, that's been very important in Indonesia, where the president has been a sponsor of the approach that we've been working with in Indonesia on, uh, and in Ethiopia, um, and in other countries we work with. So it, it creates momentum by, uh, by promoting um, uh, support from top down. And then, uh, and again, this is not for you, uh, I've heard it mentioned three or four times this morning, and I'd like to now pass the, 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 the discussion on to, to uh, Dr. Mitsuo Matsumoto. Yeah. You, you're, you're running a, a research program on, on RED, and, and if you would share with us some, some of the, the things that, that you're learning, the lessons that you're learning. However, on the Japanese government is uh, promoting the ODA support to uh, developing countries. So I think on a combination of ODA and uh, JCN is very uh, important in, to uh, implement tissue, uh, of uh, Red Plus. And because at sub-national or national level uh, MRV system is very, very, uh, uh, very uh, difficult to develop and uh, we need a lot of cost. So, and for such a big level, uh, ODA is very good and effective for such very big, large scale. However, uh, on the other hand, at project level, JCM is a very good and, and effective and for and implementation in each and project level, I think. So, I think on a combination of on a ODA and JCM is a very, very effective in your countries. So, so just to follow up very quickly, within this, this, um, this, this joint, uh, um, the JCM, the joint crediting mechanism, mm. and you're using ODA, what, what sort of safeguards do you put in place to ensure that the money that's going into this isn't, is, is actually achieving some of the ODA objectives mm -hmm. of, of, of what you're, you're doing? Do you have something similar to the, the safeguards that we're talking about in the International yes, Red Mechanism, yes, yes. for example? Yeah. 
And self garden is a very, very important for and, and, um, red plus activities. However, a uh, discussion on uh, the self garden is not mature at the red, uh, present level. So uh, we are uh, discussing uh, the how to uh, deal with uh, self garden in JCM. So we are uh, just di discussing that. Okay, so you think some of the lessons that you'll learn through that could actually facilitate how the, the, the red mechanism might eventually function? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to move on now to, to, to ask um, Pooja Saheni to, to, to offer us some, some reflections. Um, Pooja's coordinating the regional hub for, for uh, Asia Pacific on adaptation. And, and you know, some of your thoughts as to how some of, of these types of, you know, how adaptation needs to be implemented, how it can be facilitated, and also you know, what, what are some opportunities to, to bring the, 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 these, the financing streams together so that what's done in, in adaptation reinforces what's done in mitigation, it doesn't work in cross-purposes and vice versa? Uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity. Um, well, I'm the exception here. Today, I'm the only woman on the panel, so thanks. And secondly, I'm the only one here who's going to talk about adaptation. Uh, since yesterday, of course, we're all here, we've been hearing a lot about Red Plus. Uh, the, since yesterday, but adaptation plays an equally important role. And uh, what I'm going to, I'm going to step back and look at the larger picture, and not just talk about Red Plus as such, but look at this interlinkages between mitigation and adaptation, and why we need to look at both the issues of adaptation and mitigation. So as we're all aware uh, very well, since we have been either working here or we've been we are from this part of the world that climate change is intrinsically linked with the existing production processes and consumption patterns in the world. There's nothing new there, of course. Uh, but the Asia-Pacific region specifically is more vulnerable to climate change due to its high population growth rates. There's extreme poverty in the region, as we are all aware. And also, at the same time, to compound the problem, there are low levels regarding climate change and its impacts in the region, despite the fact that there's a lot of effort that is being made to create the awareness. Um, I have a sweeping generalization to make, which not everybody could possibly agree with, but uh, we from the adaptation field feel that mitigation alone in itself will not be able to solve the problem related to climate change. As some of the thresholds have already been crossed, if not, and some are fast approaching. Um, however, adaptation too, on its own, cannot solve the problem related to climate change. Reliance solely on adaptation is likely to lead to a magnitude of climate change in the long run where effective adaptation is no longer possible. And therefore, both adaptation and mitigation need to work parallelly at the same time. So that's one of the main messages that I want to uh, give across. So the three points that I'm going to touch on today is discuss a little bit about what climate risks mean and why we need to adapt to the climate risks. Um, what is the importance of addressing both mitigation and adaptation together as an issue and why there is a need to strike a balance between mitigation and adaptation and why there is a need or for low emissions development. So in terms of the issues of risks, um, in the IPCC reports in the past there has been a mention about risks but in the latest version of the IPCC report there is an explicit mention on the issues related to risks, which are associated with the climate change impact. And here, the risks have been defined as anthropogenic interferences with the climate system, which essentially refers to the activities of uh, man. So the risks which are related to the climate impacts, of course, creates a lot of vulnerability and creates hazards in turn, which exaggerates the risks so if we are not able to manage the risks properly, uh, the impacts of climate change will be exaggerated and therefore the vulnerability of the human population would be increased. Uh, on the question regarding the importance of addressing mitigation and adaptation together, um, even though, as I already mentioned, that uh, even the most stringent mitigation eff efforts cannot avoid the further impacts of climate change in the decades to come. Um, and this will make adaptation unavoidable. However, without mitigating at the same time, a magnitude of climate change is likely to be reached 
that would make adaptation impossible for some natural systems, while for most human systems, it will involve very high social and economic costs. Um, as already mentioned, that there are limits and barriers also to effective adaptation, which occurs from the interaction amongst climate change and the biophysical and socioeconomic constraints within which the human society works. Therefore, both adaptation and mitigation are now essential in reducing the expected impacts of climate change on humans and their environment. The implications of adaptation uh, can be positive as well as negative. Uh, for example, afforestation, which is part of a regional adaptation strategy and also, of course, for mitigation, makes a positive contribution. However, if adaptation action requires increased energy levels, it would obviously lead to negative impacts. Um, the, the IPCC has identified four types of interrelationship between adaptation and mitigation. Uh, one is adaptation actions that have consequences for mitigation, as I pointed out just now, and mitigation actions which have consequences for adaptation in turn. Then decisions that include trade-off or synergies between adaptation and mitigation is another important aspect that needs to be emphasized, as well as the processes that have consequences for both adaptation and mitigation at the same time. So as you can see, um, we are not really aware of it, but they, they are both closely related. And uh, the IPCC recognized the importance of addressing both mitigation and adaptation and presented new concepts for addressing the interrelationship between adaptation and mitigation as far, as, as far back as the third assessment report of the working group two. Uh, the, re the report noted that the linkage to mitigation when discussing climate change impacts and adaptation in selected sectors, <coughs> primarily those related to land use, agriculture, and forestry. So there was a special mention of those, keeping red in mind. And chapter five of the report noted that afforestation and agroforestry projects designed to mitigate climate change may provide important steps towards adaptation. So the adaptation, uh, the mitigation side already recognizes why it is important to incorporate adaptation practices too. And as we are discussing about red here, red also provides an opportunity not only to mitigate but also to adapt because we are looking at livelihoods issues too, so there is an importance to also adapt. Um, as uh, Professor Howard had already pointed out, why there is a necessity, well, low, low emissions development is not a goal in itself, but it's, it's a path leading ultimately to sustainable development. Uh, but the thing is the concept is still really new, uh, especially in the field of adaptation. We've not been talking so much about that. Uh, therefore, I would just like to touch a little bit upon why uh, we feel that there is a necessity or need to actually embark on this low emissions development. And um, a low emissions development pathway would, of course, on one hand, if you put a little bit of emphasis, it will help to reduce and in some uh, cases also lower the need to adapt. So the more the low emissions development, the less uh, the need to adapt on one hand. And on the other hand, it would also reduce the rate as well as the magnitude of change. And thirdly, increase the time which is available for adapting to the changes to climate. Uh, what low emissions development requires though, of course, is a more concerted effort also at the national level. So in case of mitigation, we are talking about the NAMAS, but in case of adaptation, we are now talking about the national adaptation plans, which is the NAPS. Uh, which provide an opportunity for the individual countries to also take action, both in terms of adaptation as well as also to integrate mitigation. Uh, thanks to the previous IPCC report, as I mentioned, the AR3 report, which this has now brought adaptation also at par with mitigation in terms of uh, dialogue at the international level. <coughs> um, so now what really is required is a focus on the local level, which is the national level and a more participatory approach, which is driven by the country, which looks at both the mitigation as well as adaptation. In the end, therefore, I would like to reiterate that a sustainable and prosperous economy requires the implementation of both climate change adaptation as well as to, un to start on a pathway which leads to low emissions development. Though the challenges exist, we know in mitigation itself, which we've heard a lot, 
and also in adaptation, the interlinkage, of course, poses an even greater challenge. But that is something that we need to keep in mind and therefore embark on a path that would lead us to a development which would address both adaptation and mitigation, which would have significant co-benefits, of course. Let's follow up very quickly with a question. So, for example, in, in red, we have this, this idea, we have this idea of safeguards, right? And, and within, uh, among the seven safeguards, there are safeguards that are specific about uh, social impacts and about environmental impacts, biodiversity, and things like that. Should we require adaptation funding to have also a low emissions component to it, a sort of a safeguard in the opposite direction built into the way adaptation is funded? So that adaptation funding actually does contribute to low emissions development, which in the end feeds back to helping solve the problem. Uh, well, if you see what is happening at the moment, that's not really happening, right? It's, it's also new that we are thinking about linking adaptation and mitigation together. I'd like to pass the, 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 the um, microphone to, to Maury McLeish now and, and ask him to talk a bit about... Uh, Maury is, is the Director and Technical Advisor for Sustainability and Climate Change at PricewaterhouseCoopers. And, and, you know, sh could you share some of your experience from the financial side? Um, I've been asked to, to talk about low emissions development on the ground. That's the, the topic of this uh, session. Um, and so I'd like to, in the next five minutes to distill uh, and share with you some lessons from my experiences in trying to make the landscape approach a reality in various places um, at various times over the last several years that I've spent in Indonesia. Um, much of what I'm going to say has an Indonesia focus, but there are lessons uh, for, for any, any country in the world. Um, the landscape approach, low carbon development, low emissions development, the green economy. I think these are all terms we've been using over the last couple of days, and they're all largely interchangeable. We all, we all know what we're, we're trying to get to, so I, I will use them probably interchangeably. But they do have one thing in common. Um, the landscape approach, um, I'm going to say three things here, and if, if you only remember three things from this uh, talk, please remember the, the three that are coming. The landscape approach is about people. The landscape approach requires a plan to be implemented, and we need to exercise flexibility in dealing with the practicalities and the difficulties in implementing that plan. So it's about people, it needs to follow a plan, and we need to be flexible in dealing with the practicalities. I'll go through these uh, briefly. Um, yesterday in a session I was listening to, uh, Yuri from the FAO said, the green economy is one that is low carbon, that is resource efficient, and that is socially inclusive. Now, I think these are all inherently people-centered factors. And so the landscape approach is about forming living landscapes that encompass and respect people and ecosystems and that deliver improvements for people, improvements in health, education, and economic opportunities. So I think it's important that we start with people. We don't stand, start with the landscape or the trees. We start with people. I've never seen a rural economy that's become successfully developed. Um, I've seen many that have been changed or destroyed, but I've never seen any successfully de developed simply through the brute force of external demands for a commodity such as timber or a service such as carbon storage. Rather, rural economies become successfully developed by building from the grassroots up. So if we start from people instead of from the trees, then this different perspective allows us to really see the challenge that we have to, to tackle. And then we have to ch the chance to look at local people's demands for goods and services and how that changes over time, instead of an external demand for a resource or a service. And the whole thing looks a little bit different. So we need to take a holistic approach to both the physical space, the trees, the rivers, and the minerals, and also to the economic potential of an ecosystem, the forest products, the food, and the fuel. And we've got to put people at the center of all of that. Secondly, the plan. The landscape approach has to follow a plan. Um, Sky from the uh, Climate Policy Initiative yesterday summed this up. She said, the right la land use allocation dictates who can own and use land. Uh, and that, that, that's critical. The, the correct land use allocation dictates who can own people, the participation of local people and especially so in a rural economy or a forest agricultural matrix. How important when we are talking about the forest to make it closer to the finance. 
and Mori exactly mentioned about uh, green economy, right? So my question to Matsumoto, uh, we know the TCM, as you explained, this under UNFCCC uh, uh, discussion, uh, Faris approach, and uh, you uh, mentioned about combining ODA and TCM as a good for RETT plus, or I say that forest and climate change. We have uh, several years of uh, feasibility study and involve a uh, private sector. What do you think how far the private investment will come or will come back to the forest in terms of uh, GCM? And to Howard, probably you still remember, we met in uh, Paris Major Economy Forum 2008. Uh, my question is uh, same. How far do you think that when uh, talking about the forest and how closer to the topic of financial investment or market. I believe that Australia has plan of 2015 market previously and probably been reviewed. And what is in the future for that one? Thank you very much. But it's government. And uh, is uh, talking about the uh, starting on a Red Plus and the JCM. Uh, we we'll start the coming next next year. So so I have to on uh, finish the uh, <coughs> and uh, read the press guideline in this year. So and uh, and uh, maybe after starting the red press this year and uh, it will take two years or three years on a. Uh, until crediting. So maybe I guess the first crediting credit from a Red Cross and the JCM will be 2007, 16 or 17. So and the, the experience and will be very, very good for the, uh, the new framework and before. And after 2020 framework, so I, I guess only some uh, project, some countries, and uh, will start Red Plus activity and the UNFCCC and uh, at 2020. So other other country will start after 2020. So and uh, we will and uh, have enough years to develop our uh, practice and uh, our methodology and uh, for the new framework of uh, Red Plus and the UNCCC. Uh, if, with your understanding, um, um, I, I won't respond, or won't make any comments about Australian uh, government policy uh, uh, at the present time, um, at least in this forum, I'd be very happy to have a chat to you uh, minutes when we conclude uh, about that. But in terms of financing for RED, uh, uh, it's been a year or so since I've been involved in any um, concentrated, uh, focused discussion on RED+. Plus. And uh, I'm a bit perplexed still that, um, but of course we all know the reason, uh, that we still talk about um, uh, this activity as one that's dependent on funding from governments. Because we all know that there isn't enough funding from governments available for Red Plus to um, be implemented at, at, at the scale uh, that's needed to resolve any of the issues that the mechanism is directed at. Uh, so we, we, we won't do that until we have a marker. And we know at the moment uh, I think globally why we don't have um, the sort of market that's required to stimulate uh, that activity. They're big problems uh, and they have to be resolved beyond the sector, uh, I think. So um, we, we don't have enough time now to get into that, uh, but um, there's a very big issue there and uh, it's, it's the same one that requires uh, the global solution that, that is uh, motivating us all to be here. 
You have another question or comment? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Salim, from a uh, student from the Australian National University. I have two questions uh, to Mr. Matsuo uh, Matsumoto. Uh, one is, uh, I really appreciate what you did uh, in, in the field uh, to uh, related with the forest carbon monitoring. So I wonder if uh, you have any plan uh, uh, how, how, how this result can be used to improve the MRP system in Indonesia and uh, with which organizations you work in the field and is there any uh, plan for transferring the knowledge and technology to the Indonesian uh, uh, stakeholders. And the second is the, uh, the GCM. Uh, is it a new, new kind of new form of uh, the Japan aid uh, or it is uh, different to the, uh, you know, like JICA, JICA project uh, in terms of the funding resource? Thank you very much. We will expand our other technique to, to other countries. So, however, we did not try uh, to examine peat, peat soil area. For example, the, uh, the oil palm uh, farming area. So, we did not have uh, such an uh, experience in such areas. So uh, Indonesia is a very uh, important country. However, uh, and, uh, I don't have uh, enough uh, experience in Kitland here. So, and uh, JCM, and, uh, to already uh, JICA is uh, uh, managing the some project and also other Japanese companies, private companies, and a project is uh, going in Indonesia. So, and, and JCM is a, a framework to integrate and these and early and feasibility study and early and project into one. Uh, framework of JCM. So, uh, JICA and the private company and, and we uh, will go to the same uh, goal. And, uh, so, we we often talking about the uh, good result of uh, our project and early project and also a uh, JCM project into and uh, for the one goal. Does it make sense? Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Yes, please. Thank you. M my name is Ali Akman from from uh, private sector. Uh, I just want to ask for the, the panelists probably. When we come to the to, when we look at the agenda, is is about the the climate change and our low emission development on the ground. Finding the fact that uh, talking about the RDD or even allow development low development emission now in the field is is not the sexy issue anymore. Even even the, the, the word of ID or of R E D D is not uh, is phobia for the, the important stakeholder in the ground, for the governor, for for, for district the head of district, or even for the local local communities. They want to hear they want, they, don't, they don't want to hear about the R E D D anymore because a few years ago, four years ago, for instance, many people come to them and they promise to give money. And now the money never come. And now we are talking about the finance. The finance never uh, come to the solution. Now we raise another issue with the landscape, the safeguard, and so many things. And how do we handle this kind of thing in the ground? 
That is my question. Thank you. Who would like to take that? Red is more complicated and slower than we expected, and people are discouraged. Who would like to take that one? Well, look, I, I just totally agree. Uh, I think uh, there's, I've seen in my, with, with my own eyes, I've seen exactly that sort of response. I'm not suggesting that it's the only response, but it, it has been part of um, the uh, reaction of communities that have had expectations raised only to have them dashed. And uh, I, I go back to my own initial perspective, which is that uh, partly that was because, partly it was because we had uh, some glib people who thought the issue was going to be solved very quickly and very easily. Um, but partly it was because we're trying to fix a single problem in isolation from the rest of the, uh, not just the climate change response, but the rest of the development task in countries. Uh, so that's, um, that's led me to, to uh, the view that the approach that GGGI takes in its work uh, can be very productive. If, if, you, if you start indirectly and you, you deal with red and other um, uh, mechanisms uh, for response to climate change uh, in a broader context where all of the people who have to make decisions uh, are, which, which will determine the success or failure of individual sectoral activities where they understand the strategic purpose and they can see that RED is a part of development process which will deliver the objectives that they want and that they have promised more broadly to people. So in other words, I think it's, it, it's not, I, I'm not suggesting this is the only way, but I'm suggesting that on occasion it can be, um, it can prevent the sort of uh, disappointments uh, that, um, that you've referred to uh, if, if we approach these individual sectoral tasks in a broader context, making clear uh, that they are dependent on a whole series of uh, associated activities uh, and that they're not uh, a silver bullet magic solution, something that uh, will happen very quickly and very easily, because none of this is easy. If I may uh, compliment, uh, um, I think you are right that uh, there, there have been um, great expectations uh, for what RED can um, do. Uh, maybe they have been um, too big. Um, and as I pointed, tried to point out during my intervention, I think uh, um, one, one should be most likely a bit more modest uh, by what one expects indeed from, from uh, RED. It's only providing an enabling environment. But as I said, it has to be complemented also by by other uh, policies. I think that is very important uh, because um, if uh, uh, the policies are not addressed, Red Plus itself cannot do the job. But then I would also like um, to end with a um, more positive, optimistic note. I think uh, um, also in the international um, negotiations, we have made um, a lot of um, um, uh, progress in um, enabling um, that Red Plus can be uh, implemented uh, better um, through the rules book um, uh, that has been adopted uh, last year um, at the Warsaw um, conference. I think uh, the rules to implement um, Red Plus <coughs> move into performance-based payments. Um, um, that that really is a milestone, um, and um, I, I believe uh, that this uh, will help. Um, Norway will help um, other developed countries um, also okay. deploy the funds they have created uh, um, <coughs> uh, for Red Plus um, in an, uh, a better way in the future. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to need to stop here. I've been asked to read a, a quick statement. Um, unlike yesterday, lunch will be served in the Seria room. Um, which is outside near the pool. Um, and that's where we'll be holding the, the Landscape Issues Marketplace, where 10 organizations will be presenting their work and, and sharing experiences. So it's a, it's a great uh, venue for networking and meeting new people. 
To get there, you go through the main hotel lobby and down the escalator and outside to the pool. Um, there'll be volunteers along the way with signs uh, to, to, to guide you. Um, I think we've had a, 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 far, a fairly wide-ranging discussion today. I think we've hit on a lot of topics and we've been able to dig deeply into a, to a couple of them. Um, I want to thank the, the audience for, for the participation and I want to thank the panel for, for taking the time to, to think deeply about these things and bring some, some good ideas to the table for, for people to, to begin to, to think about. Uh, we have another half a day of meeting and, and the people who are in front of you will be around for the, next, for the rest of the day. Please feel free to approach them and continue the discussion um, during the coffee breaks and during the, the lunch. But uh, let's give them all a round of applause and, and a warm welcome to our thank you for, for all their contributions.